Welcome to Stocks and Bonds Extended. If you're hanging around, then you're ready to fill your head with more knowledge so you become the best investor possible. Let's talk more about stocks and bonds. And I'm breaking up these two important subjects into their own videos. So up next, I'm talking about debt. Interest, coupons, maturities, risk, safety, consistency. It must be the wonderful world of bonds. I'm Ian Goldie. This is Finance in 5 Bonds. In the first segment, we spoke in broad terms with the general knowledge of stocks you own and bonds you loan. Now in this section, let's get more into the details of making an investment into stocks or bonds. And this discussion is towards individual purchases for stocks and bonds. And in a separate video, I go more into depth about pooled investments found in an ETF, exchange traded fund, or a mutual fund, or of some type of private collective. Now, I've been a private wealth and portfolio manager for 25 years. And in my initial discussions with new clients, I try and teach them the importance of bonds. And in my opinion, you can't become a truly great investor until you understand bonds and debt. Now, what are we talking about when we dive into something more that's basic? It's an entire course summarized in just a few minutes designed so you could go back one or more times to review material and absorb this at your own rate and method. According to the IFF, Institute of International Finance, in July of 2020, global debt was $327 trillion. And according to this 2020 report from Statista, the global stock market is smaller. It's $32.47 trillion. So bonds are important, not only because they're much larger than the stock market, but because of the basics and understanding of risk and return. In another video, I talk about risk and return. But for this purpose, let me illustrate on a historical bond. I'm going to throw this to my partner, Adam Myers, who's back in the office, and he can explain the historical yields of the U.S. Treasury. Adam? Thanks, Ian. I'd be happy to show our viewers some incredible opportunities that have existed in bonds that have outperformed stocks on a net return and a risk-adjusted basis. If we remember the 1970s and early 80s, the government was experiencing inflation and the world was in crisis. The stock market was volatile, but the bond market was the place to buy. In 1982, an investor could have purchased a 30-year U.S. Treasury bond, considered one of the safest investments in the world, and get locked into a rate of return of 14.2% for three decades. During those 30 years, a great deal of volatility was seen in the global markets. Your stock investments were on a roller coaster ride, but for the bond investor who locked into their high rate of return, watched as market fluctuations only made their boring, low-risk bonds look really good. You see, in time of crisis, investors often sell riskier investments like stocks and look for safer investments such as debt issued by strong countries with healthy balance sheets and good economies. Today, with the 30-year treasury paying 1.2%, many investors are kicking themselves for not locking into higher rate, safer investment earlier. Hindsight is 2020, and with interest rates this low, it's likely investing in a 30-year bond today might result in an opportunity loss as rates start to climb higher. I'll toss it back to you, Ian, so you can explain how you can lose money holding bonds if interest rates change. Thanks, Adam. There have been many great opportunities to make money in bonds. We can also lose money with bonds. Now, many investors don't know how you could lose money while owning bonds, so let me explain a variety of ways you can with individual bonds or funds. If something was priced at $100 a month ago, but now all the stores have lowered the price to $75. Would you buy it today? No, no, you wouldn't. You might say to the seller, look, I'm sorry you paid a higher price a month ago, but today's price is 25% less. And that is what I will pay if you want to sell me one of those. Take that same analogy and apply it to bonds. If rates go up, then I don't want uh, your lower paying bond if I can buy a higher rate today. Bonds trade in a marketplace, and that marketplace determines what something is worth. And for bonds, the factors are rate, credit quality, and time to maturity. Now, we're about to dive into details regarding bonds, so I'm going to do my best job to be uh, brief, but also not skip over 
any points that are relevant to buying bonds and understanding what you're looking for to be a great investor. Bonds are traded in $1,000 increments, but often quoted based on 100 cents on the dollar. This is also known as, a as par, 100 cents on the dollar. So 10 bonds trading at par in this example would cost you $10,000. And the statement would show $100 per bond. And if you bought a US 30-year government treasury bond today for par, and rates went even lower, and you look smart in hindsight for locking in that paltry 1.2% rate, right? Because rates could go negative. But what happens if rates go higher? Who will want to buy your 1.2% bond to pay you the same price you paid? Think of it as a seesaw. The higher rates go, the less favorable lower yielding bonds look to the current marketplace. Now you have two choices as a bondholder. Choice one, hold the bond until it matures in 30 years in this example. Choice two is to sell that bond at current market conditions, which might make you a profit or a loss. For example, the bond you paid 100 for might now be selling for 70 cents on the dollar for paper loss of 30%. Now, when you own a bond fund, you don't own the individual bonds, but rather shares in a collective. And because of this, you can't say with certainty that if you just wait until maturity, you will get back your principal. Now, some unique bond funds are comprised of specific maturity dates uh, for all their holdings, which makes them more, let's say, predictable, but you still can't guarantee return of principal if held to maturity. Of course, defaults and borrowers not paying their debt are a different aspect to losing money in bonds. Bonds are boring. Bonds are boring, and I know this because in my 25 years as a portfolio manager, I have never gone uh, asked once, not once, at a cocktail party for a good tip on buying a bond. Bitcoin is exciting. Tech stocks, well, they get their pulse going. And when there's ever a market pullback, everyone wants to know what great stocks should be purchased. Not once has anyone ever asked about bonds. So yes, bonds are boring, just the way I like it when I'm entrusted with someone's life savings and they're looking for predictable income. Let's take a look at a, a screenshot from my custodian's trading platform for bonds. And I'll explain some financial jargon that's used for buying or selling a bond. The first is YTM, yield to maturity. And the percentage formula is today's price combined with the coupon rate multiplied by how many days remaining until that bond matures. Next is the yield to call, YTC. And this differs from the YTM, yield to maturity, in that some bonds can be called back by the issuer before the final maturity date. This call feature is almost always beneficial to the issuer, not the debt buyer. The issuer, they want the flexibility to refinance at a lower rate if it comes out, and they would be worth it for them to pay a small premium for this right to do so. Someone creatively called this a premium bond or a premium call. Or sometimes there is a premium and you're simply called back at par or issuance. Bonds with call features are not as highly valued compared to those bonds that have no uh, call features. Because when you buy a bond, you will want um, uh, to know if your bond has potential to lose uh, value if it's called back. And this is expressed as YTC or yield to call. Without getting into too many details, sometimes a bond can have multiple call dates and each year that passes by, matures, the premium might decrease. A third acronym is YTW or yield to worse. And if you're a professional, you always have to explain this number to your client prior to purchase. Yield to worse doesn't factor in default potential. YTW calculation is based on the current price paid and worst potential return if the bond was called or matures. Finally, there is current yield, which expresses the annual bond income divided by today's price. Many people presume an individual bond is harder to purchase than a stock. If this is the case, then how do you buy an individual bond? So to clarify, some bonds are very easy to purchase and they include CDs, certificates of deposit, which can be bought at your bank or from some online platform. You can easily buy government savings bonds from usually the same sources. 
Now, corporate bonds and municipal and government agency bonds, they can sometimes even be bought or purchased directly. But the minimums are often beyond the needs of indiv individual investors. Okay, so then where do you go? And what are you looking for in buying individual bonds? Let's, uh, let's take you to some screenshots of my client custodian fixed income inventory pages. What you should look for in a bond to determine what is um, best determined by the investor's needs. So I'm gonna briefly explain in this overview because each investor's need is different. What I can do is share some of my financial screens and filters and use and tell you why and explain my process and thinking. And hopefully this added knowledge can help you become a better investor. At the top of my fixed income screen, you see several tabs. And uh, for this lesson, I'm gonna focus on the investment grade, high yield and CDs. So first, investment grade. This is uh, defined when a credit issuer has a rating higher than uh, the various, various uh, rating agencies. So there's different chart here. There's different agencies. Each one has their own rating. Here's a chart that shows how some of those rating agencies define the difference between investment grade and junk bonds, also known as uh, high yield. If you're not investment grade and above, then you are high yield and considered riskier. My investment grade tab has six uh, sub tabs, and I'm gonna briefly review each one and explain some of the things I search for and filter through. Now, a corporate bond is a company debt. Based on my filters, you can see I am first focused on bonds with maturities between three and five years. That's right now. I also have a filter for a specific bond from utility company I'm looking for, and there's certain certain sectors I am avoiding currently. This could all change. Let's take a look at both of these results. The Edison bond market result looks like this. The QCIP is the ID for this bond and unique to this issuance. If the same company issued another bond, it would have a different QCIP. This section on seniority is very important. It has to do with payback order in case a company goes bankrupt. See, there's a hierarchy pyramid that goes into who gets paid and in what order if a company goes bust, bankrupt. And this chart shows the order of payees if a company goes bankrupt. You see, bondholders get paid before stockholders. And from the bondholder group, that one section over there, there's also a sequence of getting paid first and senior, secu and senior secured is the highest. This means they are senior and get paid first and their debt is also secured by a specific asset or assets. Senior unsecured means you get paid next, but your debt is not backed by any specific asset. So if there's no money left over from an asset sale, then you may not receive all that you are allowed owed. The coupon right here is the rate, what the bond pays for annual yield and does not reflect the yield, current yield. Here's an example of a bond priced at 102 with a 5% coupon. If you buy these 10 bonds, it'll cost you this. Coupon frequency. Now, most of the bonds I purchase are fixed, but some are variable. But most corporate bonds pay two times a year, but some specialty bonds spread their payments out monthly. Some consumers like this steady flow monthly income. Accrued means what's built up or accumulated. Calendar uses a 30-day month and a 360-day year to determine what has uh, accrued over what time period. You see, because the common question is what, uh, well, I get this all the time, is uh, if you're a bond buyer and seller is selling, what happens to all the interest in between payments? Well, if I sell it before, the next uh, interest date or final maturity. Look, if you sell early, the interest is still accrued and paid back to the seller by the buyer within that transaction. Interest is not lost for selling early in this scenario. Although some certificate of deposits and specific uh, specialty bonds can forfeit uh, their accumulated interest if you sold early. The data date is when the bond was issued. Now. Here is a section for our yields and based on the ask for buyer or the bid for sellers. Now ask is the most you're willing to pay to buy. And the bid 
is the least amount you're willing to accept to sell. And I will briefly explain the other tabs within the investment grade. Government, government agencies are comprised of direct debt, such as Federal Housing uh, Authority, FHA, or Small Business, SBA, or Government National Mortgage, Jenny May, GNMA. GSEs, or government-sponsored enterprises, are not departments of our government, and they include uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. And there's a big difference in the guaranteed debt is part of the government balance sheet and those that are implied debt is merely a moral obligation. Now, most agency bonds are exempt from state and local taxes, but each state is different. Freddie, Fannie, and Farmer Mac are all fully taxable. Mortgage-backed securities are typically the uh, GSE backed by housing loans. Municipal bonds are issued by, you guessed it, municipalities. Now, the interest on these bonds are often fully exempt from federal and state taxes and also known as double tax-free. And it makes sense that governments would offer this extra incentive for bond purchases because investors, they're supporting the infrastructure uh, with uh, their state, you know, typically all the money goes into an infrastructure within a state or the, the mass benefit. I've purchased millions of dollars worth of municipal bonds in a single day, countless times over my career. And here's why. Rich people and high income people love the safety and reliability of high quality municipal bonds and their tax-free advantage income. During the market panic of 1997, I remember a Beverly Hills bond, municipal bond, selling for close to a 7% double tax-free yield. I bought as many as I could before they got sold out and the yield dropped back down to normal levels. You have to be very careful when buying debt from municipalities. Now, in general, in general, this is for me, I rarely buy revenue-backed bonds from airports, toll roads, or hospitals. And I do like bonds backed by utilities, schools, and general obligations of the state or county. And the reason is the variability of the income and the assets backing them. For example, a toll road's income will vary greatly with the use, but a water utility, they have more reliable income. And in times of crisis, people still use their water and electricity. So those bonds, they have a higher safety and they're more reliable. Because of this, the marketplace, well, they're smart. They price these bonds higher, higher quality. Bonds at lower yield, you get, pay more and you get less return. Compared to a toll road bond, which price higher. U.S. Uh, yield higher. U.S. Treasury are T-bills with maturities ranging from zero to 18 months. T-notes with maturities of 18 months to 10 years. And 10 to 30 years, that's uh, T-bonds. Now, U.S. Treasury zeros, or better explained simply as zeros, are part of the bond market created by stripping out, they take away the principal from the interest. Zeros are often ignored by investors who want the benefits of crude, excuse me, they want the benefits of current dividend payments. The vast majority of investors could not explain a zero bond, so hopefully you'll have some added knowledge and a trivia question to share with friends. Now, a common example of a zero coupon bond is an investment in EE savings bond, grandparents giving to grandchildren all the time. You don't get your return or interest until maturity. That's right, no monthly check. You buy a zero at a discount today and it slowly accretes over time until you receive your principal. The closer to maturity, the closer the value will be paid to its face value. Example, if you bought a $100 savings bond 30 years ago, let's say, just for the sake of argument, 50 bucks is what you paid for it. It matures on 2020, right about now, for $100. You go to your bank and you get $100 if you deposit it. But you started with $50 investment 30 years ago. Over time, that bond built up capital. It didn't distribute the income because its interest payment had been separated from the principal. Imagine you're making a car, house, or other payment. Each payment probably includes some principal goes to pay, paying down the uh, bet, debt. And the interest part is for the bank, it's their profits, but taking the risk of the loan. Now, there are investors out there who buy and sell those components of principal and interest, and the bonds paying no interest are called zeros. And they could be for any type of bond issued if there is a market in that debt. 
High yield bonds are the politically correct uh, term for junk bonds. And just because you're not investment grade does not mean you aren't risk reward worthy of a debt investment. Born from high yield issuance in the Drexel Burnham uh, Milken days, and so were many other companies like Cablevision, uh, TCI, and Macaw Cellular, ten, uh, Tenor Networks. Some of the world's most successful investors have gained controls of companies by purchasing their debt or distressed debt, where some investors simply find the bargains in the junk pile and get a high current yield and then total appreciation of their bond purchased uh, at a premium. Then total appreciation of their bond purchased at depressed prices grows higher as the company gets stronger. As I wrap up the lesson on bonds and segue into stocks, I think it would be smart to briefly explain a major category of investing that is a hybrid of a stock and a bond. And that investable asset would be a convertible. Not the car type, but the half bond, half stock. Convertible bonds have been around since 1928, but the popularity with the investing public was like asking about Bigfoot. <laughs> People heard of the rumor, but nobody actually knew any details. And that was up until about 1977, when money manager John Calamos developed a mutual fund and private portfolio strategy focused on convertibles, thereby giving investors access to this misunderstood investment and underappreciated part of the financial market. A convertible is part stock and part bond. There is a coupon payment, a date, and many other features of a bond, but uh, the key difference is a convertible can convert into common shares of the company at a future date and price, and normally issued by companies with uh, growth potential, but lower uh, credit quality. This gives the issuer the ability to raise their needed funds for growth and not have high debt payments or lower uh, uh, or leverage on their balance sheet. Now, the convertible buyer typically receives less uh, than income than they would if it was 100% corporate bond, if it's a pure bond, but the investor of a convertible could also make more in total appreciation for a company that does grow. The buyer gets some yield or interest to protect their downside, but an opportunity for a much higher return if the company is successful. Now, I like convertibles in asset class, and it could be purchased individually uh, via ETF or mutual fund. So let's use the convertible bond as a segue from half stock, half bond to 100% stocks. This video on bonds is massive. I use brief overviews. Can you imagine years of this every day? Now, I don't believe many people retain everything I just said in one viewing. So bookmark the video to reference later. I will also try to create breakpoint chapters for quick viewing and timelines below so you can quickly find the information you were looking for. Right after you hit the right buttons, subscribe. Before your next video, do a Google search for how many billionaires have been created by understanding debt and how bonds work. Some of my favorites are Carl Icahn, uh, Tillman Farida, Barry Sternlich, Sam Zell, uh, John Malone, Ted Turner, Rupert Murdoch, and there's many, many others on the corporate side. Um, General Electric, they were one of my favorites, but they mostly uh, issued debt. They were a bond debt company when most com consumers saw them as, let's say, a profiteer from dishwashers. Now, if you continue this journey, then your next stop should be stocks. I want you to be the best investor possible that you can. And I'm going to do my best in trying to explain these very complicated aspects of finance and investing into portions that you could qu quickly digest at your own pace. Until then, please invest in yourself by helping us make more videos. Just tap on the subscribe and like button. In the comment section, tell us what you like or how we can improve, it would be awesome if I can help you turn your dreams into goals. I'm Ian Goldie. This has been Finance in Five, Stocks and Bonds, Part Two, Bonds. All the best. Please share with your friends and families that uh, you want to see become financially successful. Here is a summary of what you have learned today for bonds.